Greetings and hello to everyone. This is the Business of Betting podcast and I'm your host, Jake Williams. Today is episode 45 and we have Matt Bisogno joining the show. Matt is the editor-in-chief of GG's, a leading horse racing resource for punters in the UK. Matt is also chair of the Horse Racing Betters Forum, where he represents the interests of those who bet on British horse racing. We discuss his vision for GG's and the racing industry in general. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Betfair. Betfair operates a betting exchange and is licensed in the Northern Territory of Australia. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Please gamble responsibly. As always, you can find us at businessofbetting.com or at bettingpod on Twitter. Please fire in any questions or feedback and potential guests you would like to hear from. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy my chat with Matt Bisogno. Today I'm joined by Matt Bisogno from ggs.co.uk and the Horse Racing Betters Forum. Matt, thank you very much for joining me. Hi Jake, good to be here. So Matt, take us through your background a little bit and how you got started in, in betting. Yeah, sure. Okay. So um, um, I'm originally from Bournemouth. Uh, I was born and raised there. I moved to London when I was 21, which is uh, 25 years ago now. I'll leave you to do the maths. Um, uh, I spent some time working in the civil service before going into William Hill shops, where I was first a cashier and then uh, latterly a seasonal manager. That meant I got to get abused uh, on evenings and weekends. Um, after that, I went into SIS, Satellite Inf- Information Services, who broadcast um, racing and uh, text information into uh, betting shops. And I worked in a text room there in about 95, 96, something like that, um, with quite a few of the reprobates who who hang around the racing space on Twitter. Uh, and then I left there and I did 10 years in a proper job. I was a project manager, uh, software development project manager in a major retail bank here in the UK. Um, and I stopped doing that in 2006 to try and do my own thing. Um, from a betting perspective, I guess I started um, around age 16, I suppose, but we better say 18, hadn't we? <laughs> um, yes, yes. I, 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 used to, I used to go into the local Labbrooks in Bournemouth on a Saturday and, um, and do a, a football coupon, you know, the one where they tell you which teams you can bet because you've got to take one from each section, a, 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 very, a very muggy football bet. Um, and I, I suppose, like many other people, I s- sort of got drawn into while well, I was trying to work that out. There was this racing stuff going on in the background, and there seemed to be a race going off every five minutes. And I was drawn into the um, the instant gratification of that. Um, but again, like most people new to the sport of racing and betting on it, um, I found deciphering the hieroglyphics on the form sheet on the wall was a bit beyond me. So um, I, I basically bet quite badly based on the numbers to the left of the horses names um but that was enough that was the seed was sown then and from there i kind of uh, i'm the sort of person who who wants answers and um uh, it's been something of a lifelong quest to solve the puzzle that is racing or the next race or the race of the day or whatever um so i got gradually drawn in and 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 I, i started using things like um smart sig and later on a, a, a kind of a an interrogate a database that you can interrogate called racing systems builder which is a pretty cool tool um mucking around with it until my mid-20s and then a book by a chap called alan potts called against the crowd was a bit of a turning point for me it was um not really any particular um aspect of that book but just the general notion the general contrarian approach that Potts laid out, um, it, it was kind of bonkers to me at first. You know, this idea that you you wouldn't bet the most likely winner in a race um, necessarily. And uh, of course, he was espousing the virtues of value and finding the horses who were the wrong prices. Um, 
and um, that's you know everybody who's anybody in racing these days talks about that. But back then, it was it was kind of a novel concept. Um, anyway, from there, I've, I've lost plenty of days and weeks to racing systems builder and other other of that ilk um, in search of profitable betting angles. Um, and as you know, more recently, I've kind of developed a suite of tools um, to help myself but also other people to visualize value by looking at um factors other than that form string to the left of the horse's name things like back class from form profiling trainer patterns pace maps and stuff like that so while you were at william hill and sas and the, and the proper job as you call it were you did you have one eye on becoming a an expert and a full-time professional in in the betting game and, and focusing on horse racing and then using those skills to, to build a tool for punters or was it something that was sort of a long way off and it sort of just ended up happening? Yeah, I, I, I certainly didn't. I had one eye on trying to make myself a better punter um, and had no grander aspiration than that. Um, I, I'm a bit uncomfortable with uh, the notion of being a racing expert, um, a rabid racing enthusiast, yes, but being happy to call oneself an expert, I think, is to is to walk in shoes with uh, banana skin soles. So I'm I'm happy to be an enthusiast rather than an expert. Um, and Gigi's has obviously um, enabled me to get very, <clears throat> excuse me, very close to the sport I love in a number of ways, and to help other people to um, to to get closer and to get more joy from the sport they love, including obviously betting on it. There's plenty of armchair experts out there in sports and racing and, and everything else, so it's uh, it's very humble of you to say that. But did you think that you needed a, I guess, a statistics-driven approach or a different way to, to win at racing then if, if you weren't a day-in, day-out expert on you know every horse, every jockey, every trainer? You needed to find a different approach to, to winning at it? Yes. Um, I think... It very much depends on on um, what one's objectives are from betting on racing, and and you know it's it's one thing I have learned through running Gigi's for uh, quite a long time now is that um, there isn't there isn't a single objective from racing. Some people are just passing time. Some people want to be right as often as possible, and they don't care about you know kind of death by a thousand cuts because they're because the favourites don't lose much money, but sure, as night follows day, they do lose money. Um, and some people are happier to eat um, less frequently, but feast when they do, because they've hit on a bit of value. So um, I think it's dangerous to talk about um, to talk generally about what people want from the racing from the racing product. Um, for myself. Uh, it's it's been about data and it's been about logic and it's been about um, this thing that has happened that many times in the past. Um, is there a reason to believe it will continue ha- to happen at least for the for the near future um, uh, and specifically for the bet today? Um, and if if I think that is the case, and if the you know the odds outweigh the historical percentage, then that's a bet for me, and and that's kind of the way I bet, and it's kind of the way that I present data within the Gigi's um, form provision it's, it's unapologetically um, um, number based in its in its detail but above that we use a lot of color to visualize data without having to you know do the hard yards or get cross-eyed looking at, at rows and rows of numbers so take us through the day that GG's became a reality and what did it look like at that moment or on the first day or the first month? Yeah, okay. Um, so Gigi is actually my second attempt at um, an online business and, I, and I, you know, I'm not really ashamed anymore to say that I went skint uh, <laughs> the first time I tried to do something. That was way back in 2006. Um, I had a little website called Nag 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 where I used to write stuff and sell the occasional data-driven product um but i started gg's in autumn 2008 so that's that's nearly 10 years ago now um and at the outset it was basically an affiliate site um monetized by reviewing 
products, betting systems and strategies, as well as selling my own um, occasional uh, services as well. Um, and alongside those products, we always used to have a lot of uh, editorial. Now, as, as listeners will have gathered by now, I'm, I'm somewhat verbose, unapologetically long form in my writing on the website. And, and, and I do love to write. That's really part of the reason to start Gigi's in the, in the first place was to indulge my passion for writing and specifically for writing about racing. Um, and um, I think I've written more than two million words on the subject now. So um, a few of them have been vaguely interesting. Um, <laughs> I started the data thing uh, about five years ago now. Um, so that was obviously a, a big change to the, the, the kind of the business model for GG, such as it was. Um, and it was a big risk at the time uh, because the startup costs of doing something like this are not and not really mom and pop um, lifestyle business startup costs. They're quite, you know, there's quite a barrier to a financial barrier to entry. Um, but I, I started it because I was subscribing to various data sources um, for my own punting purposes, and they were all offering something that the others didn't, and that was the reason for subscribing to each one. But uh, across them all, there was a huge amount of duplication as well. So basically, I was paying for a load of stuff that I didn't really need. Um, and I was paying quite a bit for it. So I got fed up with that. Um, and I was pretty bored with the product review stuff. Um, I'm afraid to say, so I decided that I would do this, this, um, I, I changed the direction. Um, and, and yeah, we, we, we've built something pretty cool now. Um, quite, I'm quite pleased with where we are with it. I, I still feel we've a, a long way down the road to go yet. Very cool. Why did you actually start it? Because when I look at GG's, I see a customizable form guide for, you know, I'm not a professional punter in the UK jurisdiction, but it was a, it was very fun to play around with it and see what you can come up with. For, let's say, a professional, are they looking at it as a full suite of products and an entire database for all the information they value? And then there's a lot of people in between that use it for different purposes? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think you you kind of hit the nail on the head there. Um, that it's it serves different purposes for different people, and it's deliberately um, it's immediately accessible through things like the Instant Expert, which is it, it was the first thing I built. It's basically a, a, a form profiling tool, but it's there, there, there's data in it, but it's it's all color coded, and you can see you know, in a few seconds, which horses are favoured against the, today's conditions. Um, I mean, that's uh, that's something of a blunt instrument. But as a starting point, if you're looking, apart from anything else, if you see a lot of green on that view, it means it's probably a competitive race. If you see a bit of green in a sea of red, then there might be one horse very well suited to today's conditions, whereas um, most of the opposition are not. Um, I wouldn't now, some people use that as their alpha and omega. You know, they're, they're either time pressed or they haven't got the inclination to delve any more deeply, and that's absolutely fine. That's that's the point of of having these kind of levels. Is that um, you know, it's a commercial product. Um, I don't charge enough for it to only be a product for professionals. It's got to be a product that suits a broader demographic than that. And the way to do that is to is to kind of layer the information in a fashion that um, makes it accessible to the time pressed or the newcomer, um, but with the depth of information de required by the more dedicated um, deep thinker in the punting space, if you like. Um, so those, so those, those two types of punter happily coexist in the, um, in the GG's ecosystem. So has the, form guide in the newspaper or now probably digital changed much over the last 25 years let's say uh well that's a really that's an interesting question certainly from my perspective because i i, I am um racing let, let's forget ggs and let's forget even you know betting on racing as a as it is in 2018 
In 2025, if racing doesn't address the data problem and the accessibility of data problem, there is probably not going to be too much racing around. It's really, really difficult for the sport to attract punters away from uh, things where people think they know, like football, um, to the racing product because the, the nature of the information provided is inaccessible is indigestible it doesn't mean anything to a newcomer there's no there's no use of color that the layout is the same now as it was 20 years ago the race card on the on the race course is the same now pretty much as it was 20 years ago that has to change otherwise um we're not getting new punters into the sport and and british racing um is monetized by bookmaker revenues in large part and if if people aren't betting on the sport then those revenues are dwindling uh, and they're going to football racing is an expensive product for bookmakers because they have to pay for media rights and the like as well um, there is a real challenge to engage the younger generations in our fantastic product um, and in my opinion not nearly enough is done in this space um, so i think I think what we do, you know, the proof of the pudding is always in the eating and the fact that we that we at GG's, I'm just, it's not just me. There's a few guys helping me, developers and support people and so on. But we are a very small team and we're, we're trying to punch off level weights with, um, you know, the likes of the Racing Post and Timeform and all these established uh, legacy brand names. And um, for us to innate, for us to be able to compete on a you know on an even vaguely level footing with them is testament to the product i think and to the way that we present the information um certainly that's the feedback i get from people who use ggs um and um you know i think without like i said it's not about this is not about ggs this is a this is a a big perhaps the big elephant in the room for racing because everyone's focused on now and not five years or 10 years down the track racing is going to have a massive problem if it doesn't engage when i was 16 i got drawn into the puzzle in the betting shop but i only got drawn in because i was sufficiently inquisitive to look beyond that very basic information that was on the page on the wall um, if racing doesn't find a way to engage the 18 year olds, the 21 year olds, those 10,000 people that go to a concert night who have never been to a race course before. If racing doesn't find a, a way to adequately fire those bellies such that some of those people come back and they don't come back for another concert, they come back to bet on racing, um, racing's got a massive, massive problem. Absolutely, and it's you're right. It's all about engagement, and I think nowadays there's so many options for the the younger punter or you know the younger person in general outside of betting or racing or sport. There's a million other things to do. So unless they're focused on that, they're gonna choose those other options. And I guess with your product, you can see that it's is it targeted towards the younger generation, and I'm not sure it necessarily is. But what type of adoption have you had from the let's call it old school punter that's been used to the form guide that can read the form guide like it's a new language for them and it's not a problem. Yeah. Have you been sort of catering to the younger generation or have they adopted the product much more? Historically, so when we when I started building it, um, I, I, it's, it's kind of an open secret that I licensed my data from the Racing Post. Um and you know no problem with that it's it's very good clean data and an excellent starting point from which we can we can slice and dice it to you know to do the stuff we're doing um the layout the format of the the basic race card is deliberately similar to the way the racing post form lines are so that there's an easy in for people who are used to looking you know accustomed to looking at the form in that way um when I started doing, when I changed direction with GGs from the, the review kind of an editorial approach to a more data-driven subscription-based approach, I already had a subscriber base who were reading my ramblings um, and, uh, and reviews and so on. Um, that demographic was white-collar, 
uh, 45 to 50 plus, a lot of them in their 70s and 80s, essentially, and I, I pretty much, could, I, I love the company of these people and I almost consider myself one already at 46, essentially old boys who love their racing. Um, since the data stuff's been, um, uh, since I've been doing that in the last four or five years, I've probably, and, and I think not just because of the nature of the data stuff, but because of the way I've tried to um to promote it and to, to to get the word out about it specifically using twitter quite a lot um i've kind of gone to places where younger people hang out to try and engage them and to try and get them into the the, the funnel if you want to use marketing speak um and to show them you know how we how we set things up and and make the, let them make their own decision for them. As a result of that, um, the the average age is changing, and, and in actual fact, talking about an average age or an average demographic is um, is not really appropriate because in the same way that um, we have people with different levels of knowledge and ability, different levels of inclination to get stuck in, different amounts of time available to do their study. Um, so we have different ages uh, now ac ac excuse me accessing the product and that's quite gratifying so um, uh, that's a very long answer to your question but basically yes we are seeing a lot more young people coming in and I think that's because the nature of the way we present the data is much more accessible than the the traditional means of of uh, you know showing past performances yeah, absolutely. So how do you deal with objective versus subjective data? And I know, you know, oftentimes form guides will just have the information there and there won't be much analysis around it or any curating of that. But if you have a speed rating, for example, and it's a horse that's led a very slow run race, does that horse get a, a good speed rating versus a horse that might have sat second or third in a very fast run race and might have actually gone quicker than the other horse? How do you sort of curate your information and data for the the end user in terms of subjective data? Yeah. Okay. Um, we we don't do much in the rating space at all. Um, we do have a rating which I license from a chap called Peter May who uses a uh, basically an AI engine to produce his numbers. And because they're um, they're essentially under bet, they they've performed very well over time and and um, with the greatest respect to Peter, he's a wonderful guy, and you know, as I say, has produced a, a terrific rating set. I think he would admit that he's not a fantastic marketer. Um, that's not what he wants to do, and you know, we kind of benefit from that under the radar, unexposed nature of those numbers. Um, they're presented black box. They are what they are. Okay. Um, I, I don't presume to ask how they're arrived at. Um, uh, but I do know that they perform very well. We track, we have one um, specific context in which we track them, which is in five furlong sprints. Um, you know, in theory, a, a speed, if a speed rating can't hold up over time in five furlong sprints, it is probably not a very good speed rating. Yep. Um, Peters do very well in that context. And we have, a, as I say, a forum thread that tracks that for people who are interested in such things. Um, more generally, we, 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 with the absence of uh, um, widespread provision of sectional timing, which is something we might discuss under the HBF um, section, um, I think um, I think time, times and speed in British racing is a is a, an area ripe for development. Um, Gigi's Gold does not have anything particularly in that space, um, and the the financial barrier to entry, the guys who produce the, um, the sectional timings, TPD. Um, they're, they're very nice guys to talk to. Uh, it's quite difficult to get a um, anything uh, remotely resembling a commercial arrangement with them at this stage, you know, and again, it's, um, they're, they're kind of trying to find, a, um, they're trying to find their, their place in the market. And because, because of the absence of awareness around sectional timing in this country, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of education that needs to go on almost before anyone's going to pay for the data. For example, I could pay for the data, but I 
I would have zero confidence that I'd be able to sell it on to my subscribers because they wouldn't know how to use it. Um, so that's that. So in terms of subjective versus objective, we we pretty much only have objective data, um, things like trainer profiles and patterns, uh, uh, pace profiles, pace maps, based on the historical performance of run styles, um, tools that enable you to slice and dice the past performance of horses, trainers, jockeys or sires by various race codes or time off or headgear or um, jockey and so on. Um, it's all it's all very objective. Yeah, okay, interesting. So what about Matt, the the racing enthusiast and punter and doing his own form analysis? Have you found certain areas to be much more predictive? And the reason I ask is because nowadays it seems like people are questioning the value of weight or if it's been overvalued in the past because a lot of people will grab the old form guide. See, number one has the most weight and all the way down the bottom and they'll gravitate to what the handicap is thinking and, and the top weights uh, oftentimes. Have you found things like weight to be uh, an interesting factor that you can dig into and, and find an edge in or it might be you know past performance of jockeys or trainers or things like that that you've you know uncovered yeah i mean i i I'd, I'd certainly be more interested in um uh in trainer angles than something like weight just to touch on weight for a minute i mean i think you know as far back as nick mordin's book i think it was betting for a living um he'd kind of he'd um, extended some American research on this, which basically said that um, essentially less weight won't make a slow horse faster. Um, and the speed with which it slows down a fast horse is probably overstated. Um, there are also things like class angles in there. I mean, if a horse carried nine stone seven last time and is carrying 11 stone today, um, you, know, you can expect that weight differential to have an impact. Um, if it carried nine stone seven last time, it's carrying nine stone ten today. It's kind of moot whether th those three pounds are, are, you know, for the horse that it beat one length, whether those three pounds are enough to stop it beating that horse by at least a neck this time. Um, I would suggest. Uh, I, I certainly don't look at that. Um, n not in the not in the minutiae. You know, like I say, if there's a big a big differential then that's that's something else much more material i think is the the ability of the horse to carry weight generally um a small horse will struggle under a big weight a big a, a big weight hike to a big horse may be less of an impost than it first appears you know i mean if you've got a six foot guy and a five foot guy and they're both asked to carry a, a 14 pound pack on their back it's going to have a different impact on the two guys um it's the same for race horses so um as a punter, I like uh, – there are certain there are certain setups that I like. I love heavy ground. Um, I have something called the rule of two. I'm always interested in a horse that's won twice on heavy when the race is heavy today, regardless of its recent form, and especially regardless of its recent form if it wasn't on heavy ground. Because heavy ground is an extreme condition um, that, in my opinion, is, is almost um, – is – when a race is run on heavy ground, the going is the most important factor, um, certainly the way I bet. And, um, you know, it's, it's not surprising anymore the number of nicely priced horses with back class on heavy that, but no recent form running on, on sounder surfaces that revert to type when they're, when they're racing in the deep mud again. Um, I like exposed form handicaps. I like the fact that we kind of know what we're dealing with there. We're not expecting any horse to step significantly forward. Um, and we pretty much know that everything we need can be gleaned by cross-referencing the form book with the race conditions. Um, you know, what, which horses are suited to by today's going, class, distance, which one in today's field size, uh, which horses are drawn favourably based on historic draw profiles, um, which ones have got the right pace profile for the race which trainers are in and out of form and um you know, it's starting to sound a bit like a um a, a, a marketing uh, an advertorial but but basically Gigi's has been built 
to answer those questions in the shortest amount of time possible. Um, so it, certainly a number of our form tools don't work well in, let's say, three-year-old handicaps where you're trying to project which horse can jump forward the most today um, or in two-year-old maidens. We've got different information that will support you with that. But, um, you know, so the, the most popular tool is Instant Expert and, and that wouldn't really help you in a race where there's little form or most of the horses are, you know, largely unexposed. Um, uh, one other thing about my punting style is um, I'd always be asking what's different today? What's a horse doing differently? You know the old adage about if you do the same thing, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Well, trainers are as aware of that as anybody else. And if you've been running a horse, under X condition without success, the sensible thing is to try Y. Um, and so it's kind of like identifying what's different, what what a horse is doing differently today, um, and whether a trainer, a trainer's past history in doing that different thing has been successful or otherwise. Um, and that's what I mean really by trainer profiles. Um, so that would be another angle that I, that I um, bring to bear in my own punting. You see the numbers. You want more control. On the Betfair Exchange, you can back, lay, trade and set your own odds. So join the world's largest peer-to-peer -peer betting platform. Get into the game within the game at betfair.com.au. Gamble responsibly. Do you specialise in an area or a jurisdiction or are you happy to go far and wide if the, the information says that there might be an edge there? Um, I bet ex almost exclusively in the UK with the exception of the Breeders' Cup, which is a meeting that I love. Um, now, obviously, well, not obviously, Gigi's doesn't carry US racing form. Um, so the, the, the toolkit that I have for dissecting uh, American racing and particularly the Breeders' Cup meeting is completely different. But I, I, I'm a big fan of the way um, the daily racing form, the US equivalent of the racing post, lays out the past performance lines. Um, there's a lot of running style information there. There's a lot of, um, they have, we have something in Gigi's which I um, unashamedly borrowed from DRF. Underneath the running lines, they have trainers, the trainers two year performance with um, things like turf to dirt or sprint to route or off a layoff, things like that. Um, and it's really insightful data. So we have something called trainer snippets now on Gigi's, which basically does the same thing um, um, that highlights uh, a trainer's performance with, as I said, you know, these kind of these material changes to the horse today. Um, I love bet, betting the Breeders' Cup. I've done it with so it's a very it's a fiendishly difficult um, meeting to bet. I've done it with some degree of success. I've also had some horrible uh, wipeouts um, it's that kind of meeting but yeah apart from apart from the UK racing the Breeders Cup would be my big my big international um, guilty pleasure if you like that's Del Mar right it was Del Mar last year it's uh, it's a traveling circus it okay. moves around uh, from year to year hasn't been on the east coast for a while because of some political uh, uh, ruminations um, but it's moved up and down the west coast normally in um, Santa Anita it's going to be back to Churchill Downs this year which is a uh, a track that's hosted it many times um, not as warm or exciting from a tourist perspective as uh, Del Mar or um, Santa Anita but um, but the racetrack itself and the punting there has many charms that's unusual. Racing executives with some political toing and froing. So anyway, I know, I know. who to thank it. <laughs> so I want. So I've I've seen the instant expert, and I saw a feature. Then what? Where you basically go? It seems like you go through the performances of other horses in a race that a horse was been to basically see if it was, I guess, a, a competitive or a good race, and see if other horses out of that race have been successful. Uh, the shortlist system. Where do you suggest people start with Gigi's? There's so much in there. There's so much, you know, value to it. If you know where to look, how do you how do you get started with um, finding sort of different angles in in Gigi's? Yeah, um, it's it's that that's a really difficult question to answer because, um, as I said already, you know, that you, different 
kinds of people come to the site and, and they've got uh, different objectives. They've got different amounts of time available. They've got different levels of they, they, they enter the space with different levels of knowledge. Um, so a newcomer, uh, a time poor newcomer should probably start with stat of the day. That's our tipping service. Um, that's as good a place as any to start. It's been doing very, we've been running that for um, around about six years now and um, we're over 500 points up. Um, one better day, Monday to Saturday. So um, the strike rate is nearly 30% and the ROI, I can't remember. Anyway, it's, it's, it does very well. So that's a good starting point for people who don't trust their own judgment. Um, I would encourage people to, you know, increasingly to back their own judgment because that's where the value lies. That's You're more likely to not get restricted if you're backing your own judgment, if there isn't a pattern or profile to your wagering. Um, so within the, the GG's Gold Toolkit, certainly uh, the shortlist is, is a very good starting point. I wouldn't necessarily recommend using it as an end point, but if you want to know a horse that's well suited to conditions, look there and then go and look at the instant expert for that race and see how much how much uh, competition there is to the horse based on um, the overall form profile of all of the runners in the race. And then, you know, from there, I'd, I, the, the most underused thing, I think, not just on Gigi's, but in British racing form study generally is pace, um, understanding how a race will be run, understanding which horses will be suited by that, understanding um, which what the historic the historical run style how the historical run styles are performed um and factoring that into the overall uh wagering conundrum so for instance we have um we have visual pace maps and data pace maps um people can can mess around with those they can change the going ranges and the field size ranges to get um as long as there's enough data to get a you know a really kind of homed in snapshot of, of of the pace profile that might be suited um i think if i if i get we also put a pace prediction on there and where there's a probable loan speed if i think there's going to be um a horse that's likely to get a soft lead um particularly in something like a staying handicap chase where i'm not you know perhaps at a lower level where i'm not expecting any horse to to sprout wings in the last quarter mile you know they're all plodders that's why they're there if something's got an easy lead um you've got every chance of staying where it is and just using that head start to just keep on rolling because something else is not going to be able to find a gear change so those regardless of recent form regardless of suitability to conditions you know obviously those are pluses if you can add them as well but if you've got a soft a horse with a soft lead that's a a very powerful in to a race and i you know I'd, I'd kind of encourage people to um to experiment with pace much more in their betting to to try and make it work for them because it's definitely an underbet area in british um in racing markets um so that that would be another one i mean there's 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 there, there are so many jake and um you know they're, they're probably more obvious ones than pace that i haven't touched on yeah, when I was looking through, I was sort of intrigued by some of the, the factors you've got in there, some of the different uh, suite of products you, you offer. And I think for those in other jurisdictions, even having a look at what you might value or what, if, what you offer and then seeing if anything that can be added to what someone else is doing, even if it's in a different country or continent and, and want to add things to their own form and learn how someone like you've put it all together. It's, it's pretty interesting. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and as I've said, I've, um, you know, I've kind of, uh, curated bits and pieces from from um, the way form is presented in other countries, and and I think that's one of the again, there's that education thing to some degree. But if it's fairly um, logical, the, the the barrier to entry is not high, and the fact that it's not being presented in a certain, in that format elsewhere gives you a USP, but also it gives you a potential edge on the market. And that's really what we're trying to do by presenting, you know, Instant Expert pays no heed to recent form. 
um, which is overbet. You know, it's overbet for a reason because it's highly material. But but nevertheless, it is overbet. So Instant Expert will show you, you know, the past previous form which is relevant in today's race context and that is often under bet the starting price market may catch up with that but if you're betting at 11 o'clock in the morning you're probably getting a 20 25 percent uplift on whatever you want to back yeah it's 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 very very interesting so i want to i want to make sure we spend a little bit of time on the hbf so sure t- tell us how you got involved and, and what you're doing now for for the horse racing betters forum yeah okay so um, hopefully, um, <clears throat> a growing number of your listeners, excuse me, <clears throat> hopefully a growing number of your listeners will be um, aware of HBF, perhaps not what we do uh, in fine detail, but at least have heard of us. HBF is the Horse Racing Betters Forum. Um, we were created in, in 2015 um, out of a, a BHA, a British Horse Racing Authority, desire to, um, to uh, make the racing product more attractive to essentially to grow betting revenues on the sport. Um, we, uh, we, I, for my part, I applied along with, I think about 150 other people to be on the forum and was, um, was happy to be invited to join. Um, since we started in late 2015, we've, our first challenge is credibility. Um, we we are a lobby group essentially, which means we're always asking other people for things they don't want to give us, um, which is you know it's kind of a challenging climate in which to operate. Um, so you can't just go in all guns blazing on day one with your shopping list because <laughs> that's not the way the world works. Um, so we we spent our formative uh, period kind of fostering and forging relationships both inside racing with the horsemen and the BHA and the race courses um, and externally with regulators and operators um, trying to prove that we are both credible and reasonable that we um, that whilst we have our own agenda of course on behalf of punters um, we recognize that it's a two-way street and um, that whatever ground we ask any other party to concede um it's got to it's got to have some sort of mutual benefit um so since we started out anyway um uh, we've we've achieved a fair bit i'd say we've um the declaration of wind ops was was um was quite a good one and it's it, you know we're still too still too early stage to to have any kind of a, a strong view on um the materiality of that um, but certainly the Racing Post publisher table, which shows the, the various um, bits and pieces like beaten favourites and um, headgear and wind ops and so on. And the wind op, both the win, uh, the win percentage for first time wind ops and the, um, the loss as it is, the win percentage is higher than everything except beaten favourite last time. Um, and the win, the loss to levels is lower than I think everything on that on that table so um, you know it is material information that you can't make a profit in and off that one data element but you can generally expect a horse to step forward the, the evidence thus far and again it's early stage and I'm looking forward to to um, to digging into it in a bit more detail when there is a, a you know a reasonable data set um, the early evidence is that this is a material element, not so, not like like anything else, not not material enough in itself to make a profit blindly, but certainly a positive indicator to a horse's chance. Um, so that's something that we're we're pleased to have been able to um, to drive through. Um, Britain Britain has a, a a problem which is unique, well not not unique, but it's different from a number of racing jurisdictions in that the the, the race course confirmations and topology um, is is very broadly variant, um, and this is uh, this is um, exacerbated by the fact that uh, ground staff choose to, for good reasons, to move the rails to um, 
to find fresh ground. For, so obviously, you know, there's very good health and safety reasons to do that. But from a punting perspective, you can be looking at a race in the paper that says it's two miles and the actual race distance is two miles and a furlong or a mile and the actual race distance is a mile and nearly an extra furlong. And, you know, it's kind of material differences to um, to the, the, the distance of races. So we were... Um, we were pivotal in getting the re-measurement of race courses, Simon Rowland's particularly uh, important in that piece. Um, and now we're trying to push for the, publica- the publication in advance of declarations of any changes to race distances so that punters have that information to hand before they're thinking about making a bet. If you're betting a short runner in a race where um, so that's a that's a horse that barely gets the trip in a race where the trip is extended by a furlong. Um, you, you you maybe don't want to be betting that horse. Uh, so that's another thing. Tightening of non-runner rules is another one. Um, Forty-eight hour declarations for Cheltenham, which is which has been widely lauded um, in, in the aftermath of the, the recent jamboree in in the West Country. Um, that was something that we were instrumental in pushing through as well. Um, but there's still there's a lot more to do and 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 being honest what's left to do is 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 are the big things um so fairness around terms and conditions issues with withdrawal of funds of course restricted accounts and minimum bet liability these are the um these are the the big um headline grabbers that will probably be judged on over time and as i said at the start you know we we it's not possible for us to go in on day one, make a big noise and make these things happen. We've had to work since we started and we continue to work with um, regulators and operators and the BHA to to try and drive these things forward. And I, I'm cautiously optimistic that in the next three to six months, we might see some um, some quite material traction in this space. It sounds like there's a theme to a lot of what you just mentioned and that is that there's a thirst for information and even though you know you talked about wind ops before you talked about non-runners obviously there's a lot of different elements to it and I know in Australia dual acceptors has been one where the horse might be entered in two races on the same card or even in two different states for example and you don't know where the horse is going to be so how can you possibly do form or a speed map or pace analysis if you know one of the major horses in the race you're not even sure is going to be there it may not be valuable information to everyone but it certainly would um, help stimulate market activity and that should be one of the aims of of all the stakeholders so hopefully there's some positive steps on that regard i want to ask about sort of the marketing in general of racing and we've seen or certainly i've noticed a shift towards you know, bands or DJs playing at, at racetracks, uh, more about the, the party culture and atmosphere to try and cater potentially to the younger audiences. What has been the approach, I guess, from, from your perspective um, in the UK for the, the general marketing of racing? And I, we've, we've spoken about sort of the, the overall dynamic chess game that is, you know, doing form and picking a horse and, and hopefully picking a winner. Is that being focused on at all, or is it shifting more towards the, um, I guess, the recreational punters being there to, to have a bit of a, a day out rather than focus on the core elements of what racing has always been? Mm. Uh, it, it, that's a really good question, and I think um, uh, the, the short answer is that lots is being done to market race courses and very little is being done to market betting on racing. Um, more, specific, more, ge- more generally or more fully, um, British Racing has a marketing arm called GBR, Great British Racing, and that is uh, that is funded by the race courses. And essentially, its job is to get people into racetracks. Um, they don't they don't do they do almost nothing in terms of the um, the betting part, the betting component of the racing experience. They're they're uh, much about the horse and about the social aspects and and i've got absolutely no problem with that um but i do think that they are they are focused on um almost to the exclusion of the betting product and that you know that suits the sponsors of great british racing the race courses their their job is to get people through the turnstiles to get them into the restaurants to get them into the bars to get them to buy concert tickets 
Um, but I, I, I can't help but feel that there's a huge, and, and I mean probably the single biggest missed opportunity in racing is not engaging the concert crowds in the betting product. Um, they're there for a good time. They've had a few beers. They, they, they may or may not bet, but they're betting completely blindly because they've got no idea how to – they've got this – incomprehensible form guide so what they're going to end up doing most likely is either not bet bet the color that they like you know the silks color that they like or go with the tip in the form guide um none of those approaches are progressive none of them engage somebody sufficiently to make them want to come again and try and understand things a little bit more um and that's it's a source of deep frustration to me britain um continues to have uh, a group of of volunteers at some of the larger meetings called race makers. Um, they they were born uh, as part of the legacy, I suppose, of the games makers at the 2012 Olympics here, um, and they're they're on the race course on major race days to help people um, find their way around the course, to help them understand the race card and so on. These people are not deployed on concert nights and to me it's just like you know you, you kind of put you, you put people who can help newbies in a in an environment a big race environment where most people are not newbies um and you don't put them in an environment where most people are newbies i, I just I, I, it, it um it baffles me um and moreover the cost of in any business the cost of acquiring a customer compared to the cost of retaining a customer is so much higher. So why why are race courses spending so much to acquire customers that they're never seeing again? It's ridiculous. Um, so the marketing of racing for me is a big challenge, particularly in the betting context. Um, and I think much more focus needs to be put on the retention of race goers rather than the acquisition of race goers. And I think one of the core pillars of retention should be around engaging people in the punting puzzle. The Betfair Exchange isn't a house that sets the odds. It's betting at its purest. One punter's opinion against another's. Play the game within the game at betfair.com.au. Gamble responsibly. You mentioned sectional timing before in, and on the topic of the punting puzzle it certainly fits in, I would say. How do you explain it to someone who may not fully understand why or how it fits in and what value it could have in the marketplace, even if that is including an investment in time and education for the value of sectional timing? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest way to explain sectional timing or, or indeed time in races generally is to compare it with a track and field race or an athletics race. Um, and I think you can think of examples where uh, 15, no, let's say 5,000 meter runners have, um, with pacemakers at a, at a diamond league race, um, have broken the world record. And then they've gone to an Olympics or a world championships where there, of course, there are no pacemakers. And they've, um, um, you know, the nature of the race is that they've crawled round and it's been a sprint finish. And they've failed to qualify and they're the best runner in the world, the fastest runner in the world. Now, in athletics, everything is on the clock. It, you know, you know, the split times, you know, you know everything. So you know that it's going to be a slow run race. You know that, um, that the, the, the quick finishers are going to be favoured. And um, those who bet athletics, I don't know if they bet in running on 5,000 metres, but, but those who bet athletics, if they could bet in running, they could fill their boots in that context, assuming the market wasn't already sufficiently sensitive to that in racing it's a it's a very recent thing in british racing on atr to have a stopwatch on the screen um and they stop it every furlong so you can see the the furlong split times um it's the same kind of principle with the um with the uh with the athletics race that you can see that if a, if a race is 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 quickly run in the early part it's going to be attritional because it, a lot a lot of the a lot of the competitors are not going to be able to see the race out and it and and conversely if it's slow through the early fractions you can you can know it's going to be a kind of a sprint finish 
um, and the sectional data will will confirm the visual impression of that. Um, I, uh, to be honest, it's not an area that, that I'm particularly familiar with myself. So um, I hope I've done it justice just now. And I, you know, if if I haven't, then then I hold my hands to that um, because it, again, you know, the, ed, the the education, the tools to learn. Um, and the and the the data examples on a day to day basis to engage that learning are not present in the UK market. So, what are the what's the most or one of the most critical topics you've got coming up for 2018? And you touched on a lot of them earlier about you know account restrictions, you know minimum bet liability, things like that. Is does one stand out that you're going to be uh, most adamant on and trying to have imposed in the industry? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um, with our, you know, with our kind of selfish, with our blinkers on, um, we'd really like to make some some headway on minimum bet liability. And there's been a lot talked about it from various parties, suggesting that um, somebody has to pay for. You know, it's going to be it, it will be advantageous to the better punters and disadvantageous to the the kind of the, the so-called recreational or mug punters. Um, I, I retain the view that. Uh, that the two are not ne- necessarily mutually exclusive. That it can be that that the, that the recreationals and their concessions don't don't have to suffer at the hands of the what Greg Greg Wood called the wide um, gap between the recreationals and the pro punters. Um, I, I think I think that we can. In the short term, it's going to be a challenge for operators if they choose to engage with MBL. Um, but the challenge is, is, is one of turnover and of trying to stimulate um, growth in revenues such that a slightly lower gross margin on a higher turnover doesn't impact their bottom line. And, you know, I think, I think we much more so – that, so that's local to HBF. That's what – I think that's one of the things that will be judged by this year and, and we're happy um, so to be. But I think, you know, that's kind of small beer in the, in the wider – gambling context and i think things we've seen a lot of stuff lately coming out about um failings from operators around problem gambling and anti-money laundering and really some of the stories are horrific um and and unsurprisingly the regulators are going to make swinging changes to ensure that this kind of stuff stops um and i think you know that those are kind of, they're going to be the real hot topics of 2018 because i think we're going to see a number of operators, not really bookmakers, but, you know, the marketing companies who are badged onto a white label platform. I think we'll see quite a few of these going to the wall because they won't be able to make it pay in a newly safeguarded environment. Um, so, you know, whatever whatever HBF wants to achieve in terms of stimulating growth in in um in the in betting revenues we have to do that knowing that there's kind of a macro environment where certain other things are going to be much more important for operators to get their house in order um, and if we have to wait in line behind that then it's going to be it's going to be very very hard for us to argue a case to be in front of that um, nevertheless we'll keep kicking and um, uh, you know I, I'm I, I'm actually um, uh, maybe stupidly but or naive, naively, but I'm actually quite optimistic about what we might be able to achieve um, in 2018 on on behalf of British punters. So more broadly and generally, where is the industry at? Is it, uh, you know, stalling a little bit and it's at a, a fork in the road? Is it going really well and there's certainly issues to cover off, which will be, and, and hopefully they can be sort of nipped in the bud and can continue on strongly? Or is it not as optimistic as that and things sort of are at a tipping point perhaps what is your general sense about the overall uh, <clears throat> industry yeah I, I think it I think it very much depends on which side of the counter or fence you sit um, I, I would see the current situation as uh, an overdue correction um, I think operators um, and I use that word rather than bookmakers for reasons that I just outlined. You know, I think there's a lot of operators who are not really interested in the business of bookmaking, but rather taking a percentage on their marketing spend. Um, uh, and um, I think 
there's been a lack of regulation. There's been a lack of policing of the space for most of a decade now. Um, and under the um, under the particularly pointed teeth of Sarah Harrison's stewardship at the Gambling Commission, I think she's done an, an outstanding job. Um, and I think she's a real miss to um, to the commission when she goes and takes up <coughs> a position in in um, in uh, the civil service. Um, under her stewardship, anyway, the commission has really kind of played catch up in quite a big way, and they're 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 well on the front foot on a number of different uh, fronts, and it's making life very difficult for operators currently. Um, nothing that shouldn't have been done drip fed over the last decade and it's essentially the case that 10 years worth of uh, regulation is being brought to bear in 18 months. Um, so, so my personal view is that once um, once these regulations and there's more to come I'm sure around um, AML and um, um, GDPR, privacy of data and information, um, uh, withdrawal of funds is another one there's a whole raft of things still to be addressed but once this regulation is is in situ and the necessary rationalization in the space uh, comes to pass and those that really aren't ad adding any value to the space but just stealing a few quid while they can um, have gone to the wall or been um, been consumed or subsumed by bigger fairer better players I think We'll have a we'll have a, an environment which is um, which is much better for both punters and operators. And um, you know we, we we kind of there there are reasons to be optimistic about 2019 and and on. But this year promises to be pretty painful for most of the operators. I'd say. Well, all your efforts with the HBF, I'm sure, are much appreciated. Um, I had a dozen more questions and topics and areas to get to, but uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer. Before I let you go, what's your Twitter account and, and also the site if, if people want to go and have a look around and uh, see what GG's has to offer? Oh, yeah, sure. That's very kind. Um, uh, so my, my Twitter account, um, and apologies in advance if you decide to follow that, um, is <laughs> at Matt Bisogno. So that's M-A-T-T-B-I-S-O-G-N-O. Um, and GG's is ggs.co.uk. That's gwegwz.co.uk, and you'll see um, some advertising blurb on there that you can click on and find out more. If you are so minded, you'll also find lots of um, hopefully interesting free stuff to muck about with there as well. So do feel free to go and have a poke around. Matt, very grateful for your time. Thank you very much, and good luck with all your endeavours this year. My pleasure, Jake. Thanks for having me on. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and please support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Gamble responsibly.